Hello everyone. It's good to be back. Haven't made a video in a while, but today I want to attempt to answer a question that most of you guys have been giving me. Everyone's been asking me, how do you select the right gate resistor for an IGBT or a MOSFET? Before we try to answer that question, let's try to take a closer look at what a gate resistor is, why we need it, and why it's important to have the right one for an IGBT or a MOSFET. So, why is it important for power electronics with capacitive gates to have the right size gate resistor? Why do they need a gate resistor at all? And this is a very good question. The reason they need to have the right gate resistor is because the voltage of the gate capacitor determines the state of conductivity and power electronic devices have differing gate capacities. For example, This unit here, CM300 F-series, has a very large gate capacitance. It's going to take a long time for the capacitor to fill up. Whereas something like this here, MG75, has a really small gate capacitance. It's not going to take as long to fill up. But why is it important to control how fast or how slow the gate capacitor fills, or charges or discharges? The charging or discharging of the gate capacitor determines the state of conductivity for power electronic devices with capacitive gates. In IGBTs and other bipolar devices, we call it the collector to emitter saturation voltage. For MOSFETs or other field effect devices, we call it drain to source resistance in the on state. Just for example, most bipolar devices reach full saturation, that is their highest level of conductivity, when their gate capacitor is fully charged. When it's fully discharged, they are in the full blocking state. Anywhere in between means that they're not in their highest state of conductivity, and that means there's going to be a high resistance between the collector and emitter terminals, or across the drain to source for a field effect device. When there's a high resistance present with a high current flowing, that means the devices can literally melt down, go into thermal runaway, or be destroyed instantaneously. So, how is it that a gate driver controls and the gate resistor controls the capacitive gate? Well, I'm going to show you in just a moment. Let's pretend we'll start out with a few simple electronic devices that most of you should be familiar with. Let's pretend we have a constant voltage power supply that outputs a constant 15 volts DC. We have a switch in series with this and a switch in parallel with this. We also have a resistor in series with this. And finally, we have a capacitor in parallel with the whole circuit. Imagine then when the first switch closes. Current flows through the switch and the resistor into the capacitor. The speed at which the capacitor is going to reach the same voltage as the power supply is determined by the resistance of this resistor. If we open the first switch and then close the second switch, then the rate at which the capacitor discharges is also going to be determined by this resistor. Let's pretend, for example, that the resistor has an impedance or resistance of 15 ohms. Ohm's laws tells us that the maximum current for charging or discharging will be 1 amp. And let's pretend that the capacitor is a fairly small value then that means it will charge and discharge fairly quickly. Now let's say we replace that resistor with one that has twice the value of 30 ohms. Then that means it will still work, but it will take twice as long to charge and discharge. And this is important for devices with capacitive gates because if they dwell too long in a region of low conductivity with a resistor that is, has a value that's too high, then that means they could have a thermal runaway, like I explained earlier. If a gate resistor doesn't allow the gate of an IGBT to charge up fast enough, then it's remaining too long in this state of low or medium conductivity. It needs to be able to switch on and off fast enough to avoid high switching losses. What happens at the other end of the scale? What if the, what if the resistor is too small and the, the capacitor charges or discharges too quickly? If that happens, then that means excessive noise and excessive turnoff voltage occurs. This is bad, especially in devices that have opposing IGBTs, like a bridge circuit, because it could cause a collision with the 
upper or lower stages while one is transitioning from the on to the off state. And you could get something like shoot through happening and that's not good because that will definitely destroy the devices. So it can't be too fast or too slow. Another problem with being too fast is noise getting into the gate control circuit that can give a false on trigger. But just exactly how is it that you determine what size gate resistor that you need? Okay, so how do you actually determine what gate resistor you need for your power electronics device? There are a few things to consider. The first thing to consider is what the manufacturer recommends. They made it and they know how it works for the most part. Most manufacturers provide a range of gate resistors that are appropriate for the device that you want to use. For example, the device that we'll be testing today has a range suggested by the manufacturer that goes from 1 ohm up to 10 ohms. So good advice would be to stay within that range. If you think that you'll be using a little higher voltage, you might want to go up higher on the scale just to prevent an over voltage during turn off. If your aim is high current and high frequency but relatively low voltage, then you might consider a lower resistor so you can help the IGBT switch faster and avoid high switching losses from high currents. When it comes to IGBTs and MOSFETs alike, you should consider only using half of the IGBT's rating. For example, if one IGBT is rated for 300 amps, consider only using half of that, 150. If it's rated for 1200 volts, consider only using 600 volts. Doing this minimizes the possibility of over voltages at turn off and over current during turn on, and it makes it easier to select a gate resistor without causing it to overheat or have any of the other problems that we just talked about. There are an enormous number of ways to determine the appropriate gate resistor, on paper anyway. Look on the internet, there's a huge amount of information and so many calculations about how to select the right resistor. It's mind-bending. But the only real way to do it is real-world testing. Yes, computer simulators do help a lot, but there is no substitute for real-world testing. Today, that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be showing you IGBTs in the real world, and we're going to look at what actually happens when we change the gate resistor. So, stay tuned. Okay guys, this is the setup that we're going to be experimenting with different gate resistors. CM300 IGBT, and we're running off a Rectify 240 line. These are pre-charge resistors, circuit breaker, and a storage capacitor over there so we don't get lumpy DC. And a PWM generator, we've got the gate driver. Resistor that we're going to be testing first, the scope seems to say it is 10.4 ohms. So we're going to go with that first and show you some waveforms, okay? Okay, the IGB is switching. The 10 ohm gate resistor, that's the maximum, the highest in its recommended range. I'm going to go through the oscilloscope and see if we can see any signs of noise or turn off voltage or anything weird going on with the gate driver. So just trying to get close in on the turn off. And the turnoff looks really clean actually. So this gate resistor is pretty much taking its sweet old time turning off the load, which is not a big deal because the load's not that big. But you have to keep in mind, as the current gets higher, the switching losses are going to go higher, especially with the gate resistor this big. So let's back out just a minute. And we will switch to channel 2. And this is the gate driver's waveform. We're going to see if there's any interference at turn off. We're just looking for bumps or spikes or anything nasty in there. And um, see, there's a little knee in there, but it's not too bad. Uh, let's try to get the turn on. Let me auto range here. We'll see the gate driver charging. There is isn't kind of a little bit of noise there, and that's what I'm talking about there. You can't have it turn on too fast, or that there is going to get really nasty, and I'll show you that in a minute. So, 
For this load, 10 ohms would be good because the turn on's not too bad and the turn off's not too bad either. And the IGBT is not overheating, so just keep that in mind. When you're selecting a gate resistor, you got to take into account all those things. What does the turn off look like? What does the turn on look like? What does the gate drive waveform look like? And is the IGBT getting too hot? Remember, if the IGBT gets hot, it's switching too slowly or there's too much load current. If the turn off is really nasty, then you've either got too much inductance, too much current, or the gate resistor's value is too low. And you need to either make the gate resistor's value higher, or you need to back off the current. So just keep all those things in mind when selecting your gate resistor. But so far, the 10 ohm looks pretty good. But what I'm going to do now is turn it off, and we're going to switch to a lower resistance, and I'm going to show you what that does. Okay guys, I've switched out to a 3.9 ohm gate resistor. And the turnoff looks really good, but this is the turn on, this is the waveform of the gate driver, the IGBT's gate. And at first it looks good, but you get it out, and what happens? Yep, there's a noise. So, number of reasons that could be happening. The IGBT could be ha experiencing very high turn on current. Mm, that's possible, but I think it's more likely that the gate is resonating with the gate capacitance and the inductance of the gate driver's lead wires. That's another thing you have to consider if you've got lead wires from the gate driver to the IGBT that are really long you almost have to use a higher resistance. Uh, that's why it's really important to get that gate driver close to the IGBT but again you don't want to go outside the range. This still isn't outside the IGBT's normal operating range but as you can see that spike is kind of pretty nasty and I'll show you in a moment here. Let me switch channels. What that does. See, the IGBT's turn on is also affected by that. Now, that's either, as I said, that could be it colliding with the freewheeling diode. Like the diode is still commutating, it's still catching the freewheeling current, but the lower IGBT still turns on even though it's not finished commutating. Or that's probably more likely caused by the uh, inductance between the gate driver and the IGBT's gate capacitor. So, oh, voltage is changing a little bit, so the scope lost the trigger. Let's go back to channel 2. Oh, the lead must have come loose. Well, anyways, <laughs> yeah, I think the lead came off. I'll fix that in a moment. Don't want to touch it now, it's floating at really high voltage. So, anyways, guys, I thank you for watching. And if you need any more help, message me or comment, and I'll try to be of some assistance to you. And thanks for watching.